in order for me to flourish, to just feel joy, to feel more feminine and womanly, I need to do this for me. So I'm going to schedule it in my diary or in my, you know, in my plan or whatever it is. And if something comes up, I'm going to say no to that. And yes, to time with me and yes, to time with my beloved. So you can just shift your perspective on priorities and honoring what you actually know you need. Because here's the thing. I look at a woman like a watering can and I share this with my clients, the watering can that's constantly watering all the roses in the garden. Now, eventually you're going to become empty. And unless you are able to be still long enough for the rain to fall into you and fill you up, you're not going to be able to continue doing all that you do. And we know burnout, fatigue. I have women come to me often with these kind of issues. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of sad because as you mentioned, we live in a very masculine driven society. We live in a space where we feel we need to fight the patriarchy instead of not trying to break that machine, but actually just nourish the feminine, take back our power, see that the feminine power is in the heart, see that doing things from love and loving kindness is actually more powerful. And that's where we are going to find more power that this whole kind of circus we've created can start to shift. Namaste. You're listening to the Savannah Podcast. Join us on an exploration of Eastern spirituality, yoga philosophy, and conscious living for the new age. This podcast is a production of SavannahSpirit.com, the best place to shop for unique clothing, spiritual handcrafted jewelry, healing gemstones, and fair trade gifts from the Far East. Now, here's your host, Brett Larkin. Hello, Savannah family. Welcome back to the Savannah podcast. Thank you so much for being here, for listening, and for your ratings and reviews. If you haven't yet taken a moment to rate us, rate me on iTunes, I would love it if you take a second to do that now, even if iTunes isn't how you normally listen to the show. Remember that we also have our private Facebook group, savannaeast.com forward slash group. We'll redirect you. You can get approved as a member and we can discuss us all things yoga, conscious lifestyle, as well as what you think about the different episodes on the show. Now today we have a special episode because I ask, what exactly is tantric sex? (laughs) What's the connection between tantra, shakti, kundalini, and goddess worshiping? Why might women want to use or avoid those jade eggs that we often see marketed in tantric sex workshops? And what are the different roles ultimately within femininity and within feminine energy. Here to help me discover the answers to all these questions is Elise Carr, MA. She's known as the pioneer of the yoni heart-mind power. She's an expert in sacred sexuality, spirituality, a certified holistic health coach, tantra practitioner, Reiki master, as well as a writer, speaker, model, and artist. Today we're going to discuss sacred sexuality, how to awaken with your partner or on your own, and practical tips on how to invite sensual tantric practices into your daily life. Elise is so open and heartfelt in this episode. I love all the anecdotes she shared with me as well as the personal stories and how she really reframes female sexuality in such a heartfelt way. I hope you love it too. So Elise, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm so excited you're here and I know your work is a lot about awakening, uh, awakening feminine energy, awakening our own sacred sexuality. And I know I can imagine that you might have had a personal story or like how you got interested in this originally. Maybe you had your own awakening. And I thought that might be a cool way for listeners to, to get to know you and to learn a bit, a little more about how you came to this work. Yeah, sure. Beautiful, Brett. I guess it's a bit of a peculiar journey because to be honest, I've always been connected to this since I was very, very little. In fact, I'd say since I came out of the womb. But as life continues and and you have different experiences, these kind of senses and sensitivities often get suppressed, especially if you're around certain groups of people, have certain relationships, all that kind of thing. So the fact that I came from a background in international modeling and foreign correspondent journalism, they weren't really the kind of rumors that would normally have awakening as something had been investing in is when I came back from an international trip back to Australia and I hadn't been feeling well. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I'd been living in Asia and I've never been the sex, drugs and rock and roll kind of person. So I wasn't doing drugs. I wasn't drinking. I was, however, working extremely hard, pushing my body, doing long days of work plus exercise and, and very much isolated from all my loved ones, my partner at the time, my family. Didn't have 
friends that I really connected with. So I think I was emotionally and, and physically exhausted, to be honest. And I came back only to be hospitalized probably about five days after landing back in the country. And long story short, there was a cyst on my ovary that ruptured and this sent toxins through my body. And as a consequence, my heart thought this was just ridiculous and decided to stop. So I flatlined four times. And each time my heart started again on its own, which was quite miraculous. I ended up becoming a case study in the hospital because they found it so bizarre and try to figure me out. It took me a long time to figure myself out after that because what I realized is that everything I associated myself with being a model, a journalist, a girlfriend, anything at all was actually taken away from me. I wasn't able to, you know, to walk straight away. I wasn't able to wash my own hair, let alone shave my legs or even drive. I wasn't able to get a real job as it was termed with my degree and my partner at the time left me. So I was kind of stuck realizing that I wasn't these titles, that this wasn't me, but I was so fixated on it. And it was that moment that my life did change because I realized what I was doing wasn't nourishing me physically, emotionally, spiritually, sexually, in, in no regard whatsoever. Although I was somewhat living the dream. Sounds like you hit this huge health crisis, a low. And I'm curious, prior to this, what did your spiritual practice or yoga or meditation practice look like, if any, or had you not even come to, to the mat yet? I had, but it it was, for me, I guess my spiritual time started when I was very little. I created a, a sacred space myself, you know, with crystals and a meditation mat, and I would just sit in there. I was probably about maybe five. I didn't know what I was doing. My mom encouraged me. So from a very young age, I gravitated to it. But around this time where yeah, I was modeling overseas and I was, I was hungry for something, I actually picked up several Buddhist books and was reading that. And just in my own time, my own space, which wasn't very often because I didn't have a lot of spare time when I was hasn't been sleeping. I I would read and nourish myself and sit and contemplate. And I suppose that was me getting back into it very slowly. So I wasn't hitting the yoga mat every single day. I mean, I was going to the gym and yoga might have been a couple of times a week, but it was it was escapism in some ways as opposed to deep introspection and going within and using that asana practices. As a healing tool, I suppose, or a deeper connection, I had a different perspective then of the power and and the opportunity that I could have if I went a bit deeper. I was just slowly finding my way back because I was just so off my own path. So there were the seedlings of a spiritual practice in your youth. And then there's this huge health crisis when it seems like you're at the top of the world and, and have it all. And then what happened from there? Where did the interest in Tantra or sacred feminine energy, where did that all stem from? And I'm wondering, you know, it's, does it have something to do with this, this cyst having been on your ovaries specifically? Yeah, interesting. Kind of two parts. I guess one part was craving this mental stimulation. So I went back and studied my master's in communications, cult politics, and women's studies. So that women's studies was really this this gem, I think, that I, I loved so much because I started to understand what feminism is, what, what energy of the woman can do. And it wasn't a sexist thing. I have deep love and reverence for men and the masculine, but it was just a deep appreciation of who I am, where I've come from. And while it was a bit more analytical and, and political, it still had a very strong influence on me. And I started to read many works of different women, including that of Naomi Wolf, who has written a great book called Vagina. But at the time, the book that really inspired me was The Beauty Myth, actually. And just getting a different perspective. Uh, in the simplest term, I'd say, of instead of living a life of illusion in the glamour and the machine, even though I always knew what I was a part of, I still had a love for the beauty. But this way, I was able to step back and get some perspective and, and see that I don't choose to live, you know, in that world as, as much, even though I knew I was never of that world, which made it really hard. But the other part of my realization, this shift at the crossroads was discovering the work of Caroline Meese. And it was in doing some online training and study. And I, I learned how to do guided chakra regressions. And it was in this moment that I, I was traveling at this time. I was a bit, you know, I was healthier in the sense of emotionally more stable, but I was back in this relationship that had crumbled a little while prior. And um, it was... It was a comment that this partner said to me when I was with him that stuck with me, but I didn't remember it. I'd actually forgotten it. And now it was like seven years later, I was at this crossroads. And I was doing the Caroline Meese work and I was doing this regression on myself and I was taking myself back, back, back into my lower energy centers, into my body, into parts of my, let's say my astral, where I was holding these memories, holding this pain. And she asked me to go back into to a time that I hadn't dealt with yet. And I was taken back to a moment where I was on the street. It was my birthday. I was with this partner and he 
was someone who was in finance and he turned and looked at me and he said, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of doing medicine. And I was like, whoa, okay, this is peculiar. The whole thing was peculiar. The fact that I was reliving this memory that was so vivid, the fact that I completely forgot about this. And then he turned and looked at me and he said, if I was a doctor, I'd fix your vagina. Now, this is me in, in the moment of reliving this, having completely forgotten it happened. But I saw myself do nothing. And I, I continued on. I went into what was then actually a party that his friends had planned for me. But in the present moment, having been seven years later, me with the assistance of this training I was doing with Caroline Mays, bring it all up. I had this like wildfire rush through my body and these tears of relief and release came out. And I realized I'd been carrying this pain for seven years that for the record, nothing was wrong with me. His skewed perception because of pornography, lack of awareness, thinking that every woman's supposed to look like a Barbie doll. Didn't understand that vulva are all different, just like lingam, as we say, penises are all different, that genitalia are completely different and, and that I just didn't fit what he thought was, was normal. So there was that side of things and that made me really passionate about going, hang on a minute, whether it's genitalia or whatever, whether it's your body, your heart, your mind, if for some reason we are able to hold on to that trauma in some capacity within us, whether you believe it's your astral or the muscle tissue of your being, I can't be alone here. There have to be other women around the world who are holding on to trauma unnecessarily, who are then perhaps suppressing it for so long that it's to the detriment of their own physical being, mental, emotional, sexual well-being, and men too. So I was kind of combining, okay, I've got the analytical side, I've got my masters here, I've got this platform that I created, which was Stella Muse, and now I've got this desire to want to help people heal. And it was from there that both of these kind of springboarded me to then go and study Tantra and be certified and work with practitioners and work with the esoterics and, and work with people in the healing arts and get my Reiki masters and just build up this entire safe toolbox really learning and practicing and and you know now I'm in my kind of early 30s and and have kind of somehow managed to mold it all together to offer people all different doors into you know what will assist them most whether that's through my sacred guidance which is more like psychology for the soul where we work with the body the heart the mind and the soul consciousness and then bringing the tantra if for them the door is actually into their sacred sexuality where it's with a beloved current or future someone they'd like to be with with themselves healing that trauma and then all the healing work can come into that as well if if they want the body work or if they want really just to be guided and need clarity so overall the greatest lesson was realizing that I wasn't being of service. And through these crossroads and through heartache and physical, you know, almost death, I was able to, to get some clarity and perspective and find out what I need to nourish myself first and foremost and how I need to maintain that and make it non-negotiable no matter what and how I then can take everything that I've learned and actually apply it to be of service because to me that is the most powerful thing that we can do is to help each other rise. I love how you share this this story, this personal story, because I think I can resonate and so many listeners can resonate with a moment, very specific moments that sort of maybe don't seem like a big deal at the time. And then later you come back and remember these as, as huge sort of turning points or, or places where something really got embedded in you <laughs> that, that, that you didn't know where it came from. And I know I've been having some moments like that myself. I'm I'm eight months pregnant at the time of us recording this. So my own just, you know, identity as a female and feminine energy, I feel like is completely shifting that role of, of what it means to be a woman, a mother just is so, so different than it has been for me before. So I really appreciate you sharing that story. And you talk about now time Tantra. So I'm, I'd love it. I'd love for you to define for listeners what Tantra is from, from your perspective and from your studying. Yeah, absolutely. First, I kind of want to premise it by saying a lot, and I mean a lot, a lot, like the majority of Tantra that you see in the Western world has been kind of bastardized, which sounds horrible. But the reality that we know sex sells and that multiple orgasms sound amazing, that's kind of just been the focus of Tantra. It's been so like that, like learn how to do a yoni massage, learn how to pleasure your partner or partners, all this kind of thing. And it's got its place, but that is like the teeny tiniest bit of Tantra. Tantra itself means to weave to expand consciousness. So I'm super passionate about enlightening people to how they can take this journey to a really deeply beautiful and life-altering experience on a daily basis, as opposed to just staying in, let's say, the sex center, that kind of the animal desire impulse center, which actually also is our personality and ego, which, you know, it likes all the things it likes. But if we just swim in that space and just swim in, okay, how can I have an, you know, multiple orgasm or how can I give my partner pleasure? If we just stay there, you're not going to 
really experience Tantra. Tantra is about, you know, rising yourself, your energy, your whole perspective to merging it with heart, to having a connection with your own heart, your own truth, your unique essence that is entirely you that most people have never actually seen. They probably don't even realize there's a part of themselves they haven't seen before. So there's that within you. And then if you have a beloved, there's that within them. Seeing your partner in a different light, being able to get to that place with your beloved. Yes, during lovemaking or just quite frankly, in their presence, in conversation, in exploring. There's that part. And then from there to transcend again and get to a mental level, which harmonizes heart in the in the desire, the pursuit of raising consciousness is completely life-changing. But most people who explore Tantra just kind of stop at, at the body, at the physical, at, at the kind of tangible because they can see it, they can touch it and it feels more real. You know, it's just like people f- say they find meditation hard because it's not as tangible as let's say go to the gym and lifting weights. They can feel that, they know it's different straight away. It can happen within a, you know, a few weeks, you can feel a difference. Something that's not as tangible like, like Tantra or like, you know, real yoga and even like the Buddhist path can really challenge people. So I'd like to think if we shift our perception and be a bit more open-minded, open-hearted, people might be more open to exploring the depths of Tantra and actually reaching some shift in consciousness. And to me, that's exciting. I, I agree with you. I teach some Tantra in my yoga teacher training and I really try to emphasize to people that it's really about bringing universal consciousness, universal wisdom or this idea of Brahman into our daily living, into our daily life. And so many people just hear the word Tantra and they just think like tantric sex and that that's all there is to it. I obviously don't teach very much about the the sexual part in, in, in my trainings, but it's something I'm curious and want to learn more from you about In particular, I was wondering if you could talk to us about Shakti, Kali, Kundalini energy moving up the spine, like some of these concepts that got thrown around when we start talking about feminine energy and what these different terms mean and what you want listeners to know and understand about each of them and how they're interrelated or maybe they're not. Sure. Well, I've written a couple of posts, which I'm going to share with you so you can share with our listeners because we don't have time to go into everything. It's just so multi-layered and so complex. But the concept of Shakti is is the balancer of Shiva. Shakti is the goddess, Shiva is the god. Just so we have an understanding of this. It's like yin and yang. It's like night and day. So they are supposed to combine in a sacred union within us because we have feminine masculine energy within us, just like we also have feminine masculine energy within our relationship. So having that awareness, we're actually actually striving not to be, you know, swinging the pendulum really far one by one way and being extremely hyper feminine and let's say not getting things done, being scattered, going from one thing to the next or being really moody or emotional. Neither do we, let's say as women, want to be extremely masculine and, you know, striving, ticking boxes, not slowing down, not giving ourselves time to heal and rest and recover. We want to find harmony in in the dual merging. And that's kind of like the consciousness raising as well, because we can reach that point through that harmony. So just to premise it with that, we need to have that understanding. So that's kind of Shakti. Shakti as an essence, the feminine essence is like water. So if you think of this from a sexual perspective and we think of, let's say, foreplay before making love, and foreplay can also be considered making love too in Tantra, but it's like pouring cool water into a kettle. You've got to turn the kettle on and you've got to give it some time to slowly, slowly start bubbling, slowly, slowly start heating up before it's boiling. And when it reaches boiling point, she's on and she can go and go and go and go. We often don't even reach that boiling point. Women are hurried. Even if their bodies are turned on, let's say, their heart and their mind aren't necessarily also in alignment yet. I call this the yoni heart mind circuitry. So if we're able to slow down in Shakti mode, and Shakti loves that. She loves being, not doing. If she can slow down, whether it's just you on your own to take some time out and enjoy tea or in the lovemaking process, if your partner can honor slowing down and letting you have time to build up, it can change the whole experience. So that's kind of part of the Shakti. And, and this balances with Shiva because Shiva is like fire, like a light switch. Turn it on, he's on. Totally different, complete polarity. And I'm sure, you know, you probably experienced this as well, Brett, in your life, how you can be kind of treated almost masculine in that regard when you're expected to just kind of switch on and be in the mood. And sometimes women can be, but if we want to go into a depth of the tantric journey, then it is about the journey. And it's about the warming up and the slowing down and the cooling and the heating and the cooling and the heating. It's kind of like this beautiful undulating mountain range, really. 
So I want you to correct me if I'm wrong. I just want to make sure listeners at home can like visualize this. So, so all of us have masculine and feminine energy within us, right? So we could say that all of us have, whether we're male or female, that Shakti, that more feminine energy, that coiled serpent at the base of our spine that reconnects with Shiva, you know, universal intelligence. And that happens when we meditate. However, once we do take it into the bedroom or do take it into a more sexual context, which I I want you to do with us because I know this is your area of expertise, how does the interplay between a man and a woman now relate to that dichotomy? Does that make sense? Like the, the, am I as the woman in the sexual relationship representing that water and the man is representing that fire? Or are we both trying to get to the middle or are we both trying to unite Shiva and Shakti, but together? Like, I think this is sometimes where I, I know at least I get confused. There's so many variables. In in essence, because Tantra embodies light and dark and every shade in between, it is up to you as a couple as to how you'd like to express and explore the journey. You might find that in a relationship, and we're talking, let's say, a man and a woman here, the man might want to explore his feminine side. The woman might want to explore her masculine side. That's okay. It's just not biologically the norm. Now, I say this with complete reverence of however you choose to be. That's totally fine. In the ancient practice of Tantra, the woman is encouraged to be her most softest, vulnerable, juicy, feminine self and the man to hold sacred space, to create a place that is so safe and nurturing and loving that the woman feels safe, that she feels held and seen and heard and cherished. That is the actual essence of Shakti and Shiva when they're in that unit. If you want to play with that form and explore and experiment within your union, go for it. There's no right and wrong. It just depends if you want to go and and be more liberal or if you want to be more traditional. So does that kind of answer your question? I suppose when it comes to the lovemaking, it's, it's the same as your everyday life. It doesn't have to be any different, but it can be amplified because if you don't slow down enough and let's say take time to listen to each other, or if if you as the woman are going through a, a challenging time, you need your partner just to hold you, to listen to you, to make you feel safe and heard and cherished in that moment. That is creating love. That is creating union. It doesn't have to be sexual, but the man is stepping into his divine masculine role and the woman is able to then relax and blossom and open into her divine feminine role. So it can be quite transient in that sense, the, the duality in the role in that sense. Beautiful. I, I, so it's like when the man steps into his divine masculine role and the woman is fully embodied in her divine feminine role, is it like we both awaken a little deeper to who we are as people or could it actually trigger a spiritual awakening for each of us individually or as a couple according to the tantric texts? Both because they're synonymous. Awakening after awakening after awakening is what's possible along the path. It's not as if we just have one and we become enlightened and, you know, like Buddhas or Bodhisattvas. It's it's about understanding that this is a continual path. It's an evolution. It's dedication of your life. So you might find that sometimes nothing happens. You just make love and it didn't really feel any different. Other times you've created an entire different experience for each other because let's say for some reason you felt vulnerable in front of your beloved and something was stripped back or emotional trauma came up and you're able to release it and they were able to hold you through that. Some little part of you, that, like a little wall or a little gate was you know, burst open. You were able to let them in a bit more. You felt safe to do that because you know that they can hold you. You can merge more. You can come closer. For some people, they can have this quite quickly in their relationship if they've done a lot of work and they meet, you know, along the conscious path. Other people are very new, are like, well, I'm not feeling anything. What's the difference here? It's no big deal. It takes time. It takes effort. This is a commitment. It's not easy and it's definitely not all rainbows and unicorns. So as beautiful and as natural, as organic as it is, it does take time. It does take you to create space. And that's why I love literally scheduling sacred sessions, as I call them, or lovemaking sessions or just time with your beloved. Let's say, you know, every Wednesday night or every Sunday morning, you've got some non-negotiable time where neither of you schedule anything else. You put your relationship first. And maybe, you know, you're just preparing a meal together. Maybe you're just talking on the couch together. Maybe it is making love in the kitchen or whatever it is. But you need to invest time in this, just like we invest time in anything that we want to nourish and and flourish and grow. So I don't want there to be an illusion that it's all just easy and all just happen itself. There There is an energetic flow once you start investing in it, as we know, but you have to do the work. I wanted to ask you about this word awakening, right? Because I think 
myself and listeners too. It's like, well, what, what does that really mean? And when you were talking, what I felt from you was it's like your partner maybe sees a deeper aspect of you and you maybe experience a deeper aspect of who you are that was maybe previ- previously private or previously subdued or covered up or forgotten, kind of like uh, a, a, a samskara, right? Like a, a lost past memory or program and it comes to the surface and there's there's a release of you being seen and them seeing you which can be healing is that what you mean by awakening or does awakening mean something else like seeing god or having an orgasm or something like that in the tantric texts it it can all be that because you can have you know it's like the little eureka moment it's like oprah's aha moment they can be little but so powerful or they can be you know huge and just be like a firework where it just comes and goes to me i i find on this path the awakenings are what continue to happen as you continue to do the work so yeah everything you've said is correct and i find using the word awakening can be applicable for all of that the most powerful i find and in working with clients and and with the teachers i've had is that it is when you have this complete clarity it's like in meditation when you reach that place where there is nothingness and you're not even you're very present you're aware but you're not actively forcing anything it just is and there is this knowing within of what's going on, but there's no other thoughts. There's nothing else coming in. You just know something shifted. You might not be able to put your finger on it. You might not even be able to communicate or express it in words because to be honest, the English language is extremely limited in expressing something that could be profound for you. So it could be just a little shift where within yourself, you just know you're different and you see things different and you feel things different. And you, to be honest, you might not be able to get back to that point straight away or for some time. Because it's like we move in cycles in life and definitely on the tantric path we do, just like the Buddhist path. So you might find that you've kind of got to this peak of a circle and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I've had this experience now. But then you find yourself falling back down into the mud, we call it. So from the mountaintop to the mud. The difference is as you have these awakenings, these realizations that every time you slip back down towards the mud, you can catch yourself and bring yourself back to the mountain with more ease, with more grace, with more calm. So amid the chaos, you are the calm. And if you do find yourself slipping all the way down to the mud and getting off your path and and being quite disconnected and, and away from your practices or whatever it is, you'll find that you're able eventually to bring yourself out of it with more ease, even if you stay there a little bit longer sometimes than others, because you still know what you know. It's like a closet. We can't close our eyes once they've been opened. Whatever that is for you, whether that's just personal everyday life decisions or the intimacy of your own relationship and experience with God, the universe, source, or with your beloved. So I try that kind of helps. I guess it's quite interpretive, but that's the main gist of it along the tantric path. I think what you're talking about, this idea of bringing spirituality into our sexuality or into our sexual relationships is so appealing and it takes two to tango, right? So, so or, or does it? I'm, I'm wondering like for, for listeners and folks at home, how what tips do you have for them to start engaging their partner in this kind of work? Especially if maybe their partner doesn't have even a yoga or meditation practice, or is it something that you can do on your on your own, like without necessarily letting them know this is something you're trying to invite in or cultivate? And I, I think you mentioned working with clients directly. So I always love anonymized, of course, but if you want to share some stories of, of people you've worked with or even couples you've worked with, like typical scenarios you've seen and then tips that were helpful. I think that's always fun to learn, a fun way to learn. Typical is always tricky because it's like, it's funny because everyone is so different, yet we're completely the same, if that makes sense. So there's so many unique stories and, and scenarios, but at the same time, fundamentally, it all comes down to wanting to be seen and heard and held and cherished. So that's not only people's pursuit, along with clarity, like just to get it. You know, I want to understand this. There's that that gets thrown in the mix. When it comes to the tantric path, I find most people, they want to explore themselves in some capacity, but if they're in a relationship, they know they have to invest with their partner. So it doesn't matter. If you do not have a beloved, you can absolutely do this work. And if you do, you can still absolutely do it just for you and with them. To me, I look at this as if you're in a relationship, there is still three factors. There is you, there is your beloved, and there's the relationship. So if we're talking from that perspective, it's important that you have something just for you 
you, whether that is a meditative practice, whether that is a sacred practice, something that resonates with you, something that you're wanting to explore, just to help you reconnect with how you're feeling, where you're at, where you're going. Are you actually working towards some kind of self-growth and development? within I'm talking about. Now, your partner may or may not resonate with that. doesn't mean you don't have to invest in that. And then if they're still not too sure and you you don't even know how to introduce this, then let's say from a woman's perspective, we want the woman to feel open to inviting. So instead of saying, hey, I just read this, so I just listened to this or whatever it is and and almost demanding or saying, this is what we've got to do. We're we're missing out and, and kind of being flustered or frustrated or angry or even just pushy. Instead of that, it's so much more opening and so much more appealing healing if you invite. So saying to your beloved, you know, I came across this, it really resonated with me. And these are obviously my words, you choose your own. What do you think of us trying this? You know, I'd really love to share this with you. You're just putting it out there as if you're offering like a meal you've put, you know, together with all your love. You put it on the table and you put it there in front of them and and let them explore it. Send them an article. Say, hey, what do you think about listening to this together? So by inviting them, there's some intrigue there. They know it's important to you. You'd like to think if you're in a relationship that if something's important to you, they'd like to invest in that. You're not asking too much of them. There's no expectation. You're not going to say, listen, we're both going to have multiple orgasms tonight. Let's get onto it. Not about that. Once again, Tantra is about weaving everything together. It's about the journey, not the destination. So know that if this is all very new to you, that it's going to be, you know, a very slow burn as you learn and ideally grow together in this process. So invitations, what I, what I definitely suggest for couples, if only one of them is interested and one is unaware perhaps, or not as interested, that's a great way. And if it's just you, then honor your truth, honor your truth and do your research. I I wrote an article recently about Yoni massage and my thoughts personally and professionally about it because it's kind of like the new black everyone's doing it. And I just want to put out there that it's something that you need to really feel into if it's going to serve you, what your truth is. For women on the path, we get caught up at the moment in this new age kind of goddess movement of thinking that in order for us to be feminine, we have to put our crystals out at the full moon, go to the goddess circle, scream and shout, get into Shakti mode, get into Kali mode, like you say, which is the wild, crazy, ferocious, destructive mode because Kali is about destruction and rebirth. You know, and, and some people just say that's an excuse, like, oh yes, I was in my Kali mode. No, you had no emotional control. That's not feminine. That's emotionally erratic and unstable. So when I'm sharing here, and I'll share an article with you that I wrote about three phases of evolving the feminine from the primal animal and the kind of things we grab onto thinking they're feminine to evolving to an emotional release and calm and understanding to then getting to the place of heart. And heart is where that unique essence is that I mentioned. That's where your actual ultimate feminine beauty, that essence that is only you and uniquely you, no one else on the planet has it. That to me is the pursuit of of a woman who wants to explore herself and rise in this journey, the solo journey, being in a relationship or not, that's her work. But it's a long journey and there's not a lot of support out there to do all of that. So being aware of the illusions and all the pretty shiny things that are sexy and orgasmic and goddessy, sometimes the shiny things can pull us off our path. So always come back to your truth is one thing that I love to share with women who are exploring this on their own. And even men, it's the same concept. I just happen to be talking about the evolving of the feminine. But men too have to be really careful with their truth because they can get caught up in just the physical desire and how great. It feels just to have an orgasm instead of going, well, how important actually is it for me to look after and protect my partner, making them feel safe and giving them little bits of love every day, not just like I rock home and let's get it on. A woman needs to feel nourished throughout the day all the time, like filling up her cup. Then she's going to be more excited to connect with you at nighttime. So there's two different perspectives here because the masculine and feminine see things very differently. Learning to harmonize that in your relationship and all relationships, to be honest, can be a beautiful, beautiful way to deepen every connection you have, whether it's personal or professional or intimate. I love the idea you gave of offering an invitation, right? Just (laughs) explore this with me or I invite you to participate in this with me. And if we can't ask you, who can we ask? So I'm just going to ask, what what is it or what are some ideas of what you could invite your partner to do? And, and I want to get specific about tantric or tantric sex, right? So is it just maybe slowing down lovemaking a lot or saying that you want to have a really heartfelt conversation for, for a while that then progresses into lovemaking? Or is it some sort of position from the Karma Sutra? I mean, I'm guessing your answer might be it can be all these things, but for people who just want 
want to dip their toe in without reading like six books on tantric sex, what, what are the sort of a couple key ways that, that this invitation could take, a couple ways it could move forward? Sure, sure. And and just to throw it out there, people think the Kama Sutra is Tantra and it's actually different. The Kama Sutra is, is whole unto itself and that is the sexual position. So if that interests you, then absolutely go out and explore that. Get yourself a book. It'll all be in there with beautiful visuals and you'll be on your way. Tantra obviously has a bit of a, a, a well, a quite a large difference and differentiation. But since we're going to focus on the sexuality side of things, while still bringing in the spirit connection and consciousness as our ideal, even if you don't think it's possible right now, you're just like, just give me the sex. Okay, I'm hearing you. I I liked, as I mentioned, to call it sacred sessions. And this is scheduling lovemaking. So if you're like, where on earth do we as a couple start? I want you to perhaps look at your schedules, both of you, especially if you're leading quite full lives, whether it's with children or work commitments or travel or whatever it is, and sync up some time where you can actually create non-negotiable time together. It's as simple as that. You have to create time and space before anything is going to happen. If all you have is a sporadic window of opportunity once a week, once a fortnight, whatever it is, you can't expect that to flourish. Just imagine if you had a beautiful, you know, pot plant on your table and you only watered it, you know, every couple of weeks and it maybe had sunlight when you remember to lift up the curtains. It's going to die. It's going to die. So if you want your sacred sexual life to blossom, you've got to invest the time. So I really stress that because literally without it, there is nothing to build the beauty upon. From there, when you rock up, you want to be present. So please leave your phones elsewhere. Put them on silent. The TV is not on. You're not watching the sports game or any of that. If you have children, then obviously if they're having a sleepover with friends or if they're little and it's bedtime, you know, you've got to work around your parameters. And I and I understand that. So you've got to find what works best with you. From there, it's about creating and holding sacred space. Now, this can be super simple. It could just be lighting some candles, some music. Maybe it's fresh sheets. Maybe it's actually booking a room at a hotel if you want to kind of have a a, a little vacation, whatever it is. You can do it simply or you can put money into it, whatever is best for you and in, in your couple. But you have to create some kind of space because we want to shift the mindset from the rushing and the everyday and the work and the commitments and this and that to going, okay, I step out of that as if you're kind of washing it off you, just whoosh, let it go, take some breaths, step into this space, this space as the Shakti, this space as the Shiva, this space as the beloved. We need to have that kind of transition time. That's super important. And then from there, it's about the setting the intention. Like, what do we want to do? Do we just want to be naked and hold each other and cuddle and explore each other's bodies? Because to be honest, we don't remember the last time we've done that. Do we want to have a shower together? Do we want to make love? Does one of us just want to receive tonight and have no obligation to do anything else but receive? To be honest, we don't do that enough. And normally that should be the man giving to the woman because she is the receptacle. And often she gives so much in her life to everyone that ideally, if you really want her to be in that space where she's that boiling water, then give to her with no expectation. That's a beautiful way to start. You can always switch that around. Another night, the woman just gives to the man or whatever your partner is. If it's two women or two men, it doesn't matter. And from then, you want to communicate a bit more and be able to communicate without fear or judgment. If this is the person you're choosing to be with, if there is love there, if there is trust there, then you should feel safe enough to be able to lovingly communicate what you'd like to explore. You know, tonight, let's just focus on this. Or what do you feel about this? I'd love to share this with you. So you're doing it from a place of love. Literally, it's not like, oh, when are we going to do this? You never do this for me. You know, there's, there's no attitude. There's no expectation. There's no judgment. Loving kindness, compassion, non-judgment, humility. These are, as I'm sure you know, Brett, like Buddhist fundamentals. We bring this into a tantric practice as well. And once the communication is clear, we want to get into then the space of the worship, of the making love to being love, however that looks for you, whether you actively want to have sexual intercourse or whether that's just a connection of bodies in any way. It doesn't matter. The fact that you are worshipping, having reverence, having love to make love with your beloved and enjoying the journey, not going, okay, when am I going to get an orgasm here? That's kind of got to be like out of your mind. I like that. Enjoying the journey and not the the destination. I think so many women, and I'm sure you hear this all the time, we, we operate under such a masculine energy in our day-to-day life because that's what society really demands of us, right? Most of us have jobs and have to-dos and, you know, are, yes, we're taking care of children or executives at huge companies. And it sounds like we really need to step into our heart 
like you said, and just a different space in order to kind of be the receptacle. I'm wondering what tips do you give your clients or what practical tips do you have for women listening who are like, yes, I, I want to be in that space or more connected. I don't even know. You, you mentioned something about yoni mode earlier, so I want to know more about that. Um, but, but what can we do to, to access that space as women? Sure. First of all, we don't want to put too much pressure on ourselves because that's the last thing. If this is going to be another one of those to-dos on your list, which for the record is masculine way of looking at things, it's not going to happen because you're going to put it right down the bottom after you probably like change the dog's water bowl. So let's be real. We have to be quite loving about this and also somewhat open-minded, maybe even a little bit playful, whatever will work for you so that you know you're going to step up. And then if that's not going to happen, then you might have to have a little bit of tough love here and go, no, 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 you know what? I actually have to say no to someone else to say yes to me. This is when boundaries come into play. I work with people, men and women, but especially women, a lot on the boundaries because it's almost like somehow along the way we've we've lost our ability to honor our truth and say, yes, we want to say yes and no, we want to say no. Often this can be connected to a trauma, to abuse, to someone who has at one point crossed our boundary that we've kind of then let our guard down and we just no longer have a filter. We just kind of let ourselves be abused mentally, emotionally, spiritually, sexually. This can take many guises. I know for myself personally, up until my late 20s, I didn't have strong enough boundaries with friends and with men. As in, I'd just, I'd let them, you know, say things to me or even just touch me that I was not comfortable with, you know, and I did did go through sexual abuse. And for someone who all I ever wanted was absolutely love in a secure relationship. And to be honest, never had one night stands, never put myself in positions where I thought I was intentionally asking for it. Yet somehow, because I wasn't strong enough in my boundaries, it seemed to happen time and time again until I was able to step up and actually finally say enough's enough. That may not be your personal story. You might have other ways of, of exploring and understanding your own patterns. But in order for you to be able to honor your boundaries, you have to know your truth. You have to know your patterns. Super super important. So I know that's probably a little bit off topic, but in order for us to get to the place we want to go, we've got to do the shadow work beforehand, which we've kind of heard of. So if that's kind of dealt with to some degree, then the woman's able to go, okay, I know this is what I need. And this is a non-negotiable. In order for me to flourish, to just feel joy, to feel more feminine and womanly, I need to do this for me. So I'm going to schedule it in my diary or in my, you know, in my plan or whatever it is. And if something comes up, I'm going to say no to that. And yes, to time with me and yes, to time with my beloved. So you can just shift your perspective on priorities and honoring what you actually know you need. Because here's the thing. I look at a woman like a watering can and I share this with my clients. The watering can that's constantly watering all the roses in the garden. Now, eventually you're going to become empty. And unless you are able to be still long enough for the rain to fall into you and fill you up, you're not going to be able to continue doing all that you do. And we know burnout, fatigue. I have women come to me often with these kind of issues. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of sad because as you mentioned, we live in a very masculine driven society. We live in a space where we feel we need to fight the patriarchy instead of not trying to break that machine, but actually just nourish the feminine, take back our power, see that the feminine power is in the heart, see that doing things from love and loving kindness is actually more powerful. And that's where we are going to find more power that this whole kind of circus we've created can start to shift. We don't have to wear pants to do that either unless you want to, right? So it's like a new way of feminism that we need to cultivate here and that, that is all about heart, real heart. And it's a soft place and it's an absolutely loving place. So you know that's in you as a woman. And if you, you aren't aware, I'm telling you, every single woman has this. So just being able to tap into that very gently can help. I couldn't agree more with everything you're saying. And I think it's just so hard to prioritize. I know for myself too, because I love the watering can analogy and it's like, ah, oh, yes, that makes so much sense. It's just still for so many of us as we run throughout our day, especially as women, we're, we're take, it's not just like the masculine society piece. It's like we're caretakers, right? We're the caretakers of our family, caretakers of our husbands, kids, pets. And to do something like say, you know what, dog, I am not going to walk you because I need my own time or husband I am not making you dinner tonight because I need to fill my cup how what do you have any other practical tips to just like really help women make that shift to like this is a priority it needs to happen and then how to schedule it and communicate with others because what we are talking about boundaries at the end of the day 
Yeah, we are. I find that if you're acutely aware of where you put your time, you will see there's things that you can take out and replace it with what you really want. Like look at social media as an example, or flicking through a magazine that isn't nourishing you at all, or speaking to that girlfriend that really isn't going to nourish you. She's just kind of hanging around because she knows that you're always going to be there. And perhaps today you're not going to be there, you know, and that may sound really cruel, but if someone's being the victim and they don't want to heal themselves and don't want to work on themselves and they just want to talk to you just to vent or gossip or whatever it is. How is that helping anyone? It's not. She'd actually probably do better if you said, why don't you try this? You know, read this book, go take yourself to the beach, go for a walk in nature. Can't today, I've got this on. That might serve her better if she actively took your guidance. And if you actually invested in yourself, there'd probably be two souls who are actually able to get some nourishment instead of just a waste of time. So honestly, social media is one of the biggest things. I've had people who have had addictions to Instagram, to Facebook, to whatever it is, even online shopping or just perusing of things. Now, we all need some downtime and relaxation. And maybe for you, it's more soothing to look at shoes than it is to sit on your yoga mat. But ask yourself, do I need to do it every day? Do I need to even do it every week? There are little windows, tiny, tiny little windows. And if you have children, if they're old enough, then why can't they help? Why aren't they sitting at the table or doing little things so that you can just enjoy a cup of tea? You know, you can actually also ask for assistance. You can have one night a week where perhaps the other person makes dinner. And in that time, you are reading a book that's going to nourish your soul. You are taking a bath. So asking for assistance, being really acutely aware of how you use your time and if there's little bits you can take out. Even if you're an Instagrammer who you know looks at your phone for an hour a day, maybe make that half an hour or 20 minutes and all of a sudden you've freed up a little bit of time. Even if you can create windows in five and 10 minutes in the, at the beginning of the day you know, and at the end of your day, that is something. We're not asking you to clear like two hours of your schedule every day if that's utterly unrealistic for you. You have to work with what you've got and what you're willing to do, but know something at this point might be better than nothing. So we need to have that flexibility and also a bit of a creative mindset to how you can make this work. You know, there's all different things, even carpooling. So maybe one day you pick up the children from school and their friends and they've got a play date at your house and that frees up that mum to have some time and then you swap over. So then, you know, someone else is picking up your little loves today and they're going to go and have a play at someone else's place and then you've got that time. Whatever it is, whatever works for you, you know, and if you're stuck in traffic and you're coming, you know, to and from work and you're commuting, then why don't you listen to a podcast that's going to nourish your soul that perhaps is exploring time instead of listening to ads on the radio. Or maybe turn everything off and just be in some silence and just focus on some beautiful, big belly breathing of inhales and exhales, letting it all go. There's moments that we have. I mean, you must have at least a shower a day. In the shower, do some breathing. Close your eyes, take a moment, massage your body lovingly as you clean it. There's all these little windows that's starting to change our perception, as I said, and seeing things differently, how they can be an opportunity for connection, for going within, for calming down, for stilling the mind. All of this can contribute to helping you. I know for me personally, one of the biggest tools that helps me feel like I'm really stepping into that feminine energy of slowing down and receptivity is taking a super long, hot bath. That's my favorite. And I'd love for you to share with us, if you're willing, just what what does your spiritual practice or, or daily work around this look like? Or is it something you're doing once a week just in terms of your own personal yoga, meditation, re- receptivity, uh, feminine practice? Yeah, sure. I guess... My my kind of lovely little go-to, which is in my daily practice, is, is a bath like you. Obviously, feminine, water, receptacle. Being in water and near water for me works. Other people, it's being barefoot in nature. So if you are able to connect with something, an element like that, I know it can help ground you or bring you back to yourself. Honor that. As, as for my personal process, I have an absolutely religious, non-negotiable everyday practice. And that's also because I, I hold space with people in this capacity that to me, I need to be the clearest channel. So it's not just, you know, the food I choose to eat. It's not just the fact that I, you know, don't consume drugs or medication or alcohol, all those kind of things. I keep myself literally as pure an instrument as I can, um, even to the point of not consuming certain, you know, violent programs or anything like that. That to me is super important. And that may sound extreme, but it's only because of the work that I do and that I've devoted my, my life to this service. But as a more tangible practice, I, I do start my day with some qigong, with some breathing and grounding. I then move into an esoteric meditation. From there, I go to a tantric white tigeress practice. The white tigeress, like this secret underground sect of, of women in China who were in the pursuit of immortality, but also of cultivating energy. So I look at it from that perspective and it involves a breast massage, which isn't sexual, but 
that's sacred and a connection with the yoni, all external. So you can do it over your pajamas or you can do it naked just to have a connection and harmonize this body. I don't look at it as a spiritual practice as much as I do as a connection and a grounding and just a love and, and a nurturing because my body does so much. The esoteric meditation is much more my mind work, which I need. I'm hungry for that. That's just me. I work on the mental plane a lot as, as well as the heart. From there, I will just see it in just absolute stillness, silence, and just be, whether you call that meditation as well. Some people do. And from there, after I make something really yummy, it's just a little energizer snack, like a little smoothie or something, I'll go and do an hour of yoga. Sometimes I do bar, but yoga is what I love the most. And then I'm ready to start my day. So it sounds like a, a long ritual or how long is this from start to finish? Yoga obviously is like, it's an hour. That's kind of normal. An hour, an hour and 15. In the morning before that, I'd say often about 40 minutes to do my other practices. So, you know, maximum two hours, I'd say. And, you know, that's something that I'm able to do at the moment. I don't have a child or children. So I'm sure when that time comes, there'll be a shift in that and I'll have to accommodate that. But for now, it works for me. And, you know, unless I'm on a plane traveling and I have to improv because it's a bit hard to massage your breasts on a plane, uh, I, I do what I can. But pretty much, you know, Monday to Sunday, that's what I want to do. Sunday, I might not go to yoga. Instead, I'll go for a bike ride or go to the ocean, have a swim, just be in nature and give my body, you know, the rest from having to exercise as such, but connecting in a different way. I might even go meditate in, in a park. So mixing it up sometimes is lovely too, but it's it's a non-negotiable. I, I don't feel the same when I don't have that connection. I'm not addicted. I've gone through times when I haven't had to, but I just know that's the way I feel myself up. That's the way I feel like the brightest version of me, the clearest version of me, and I can serve from that place. So that's why I love it. It sounds like such a great morning ritual and I love that you share that you pull in these these little feminine aspects of touching the breasts or touching the body. Before I let you go, I have to ask you, because I'm getting to ask you all the questions that I've wanted to ask. Um, I feel so many, whether it's tantric uh, sex programs or tantric programs for women, they talk about this jade egg and as a component of something physically that you can do. Can you tell me and listeners a little bit about the, the jade egg and where it comes from and does it does it work? Do we need to have it? I'm curious to know more from you specifically. Great question, Brett. And once again, it's one of those glamours that has kind of been commercialized because it's shiny and sex sells. So there's a lot out there of people selling these eggs and encouraging you to use it every day and you're going to love it. It's going to make you tight. It's going to give you orgasms. There is a teeny tiny portion of that that's true and the rest is really just false illusion and glamour. So be really careful. If you're drawn to it, do your research. I'm putting that out there. I say this because I have been trained through the lineage of, of the tigeress. And this is something, once again, that is a very ancient, sacred practice that wasn't set to have you know the ultimate goal being orgasms and a tight yoni. That is one tiny facet. It was actually about that immortality. It was actually about honoring and connecting with the feminine inside. It was about harmonizing with the heart space because the jade egg that's actually used is green. Green connects to heart space. Green connects to love. So we're about balancing. Ah, heart chakra. I don't know if I made that connection before. And sorry to interrupt you. I just want to back up so listeners 100% know what we're talking about. When we're talking about the jade egg, it's a small jade egg that you insert in the vagina, right? At least correct me if I'm wrong. And then you do kind of like Kegel exercises is my understanding of how it works. Yes. And that's, that's kind of like the simplified commercial version. In the ancient sacred way, there are specific exercises that are done in more of a slow, rhythmic, breath combined way. It's a very sacred, very personal, very beautiful experience that is not encouraged to be done more than three times a week because the issue is it overstimulates the sex center. Now in this day and age, in the collective consciousness we have, sex impulse, that animal desire, that, that lower instinct place where we're like, oh, I want that. I'll have that. I need sex. I want those shoes. All of that and your ego reactions, that whole center is so overstimulated already that if you were to use the jade egg every day and people say even sleep with it, big no, 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 no. All of that overstimulates and will actually throw you out. It will slowly disconnect you from your heart because you're not going to be harmonizing heart and you're not going to be harmonizing mind. It draws you right back down just into a physical, egoic and very animalistic space. So be really cautious. And if someone tells you that, then I'd definitely be questioning and asking them where they actually got the information from. It's not authentic. So be really, really careful with that. Do not overuse it. You might even only want to use it once a week, once a month. If it calls you, it doesn't have to be like you even have to do three times a week. 
I train women one-on-one, fully clothed, whether they choose to insert it or not, but just for them to work through the actual process of the movements they do. And I do this via Skype as well as in person, but I spend two hours with one woman. That's why I don't advertise that I that I sell eggs or anything like that. I only sell the eggs to those women that choose to want to do the training. Because to me, it's something that's been unfortunately clouded with all this illusion. We've lost the, the essence and the truth and how beautiful and, and powerful it can be in its own way. So if you're interested, you're very welcome to connect with you if you've got any more, any more questions about that. If you're also curious, explore the white tigress. There's a little bit of information out there. There's not a lot because obviously it is very secret. This is something that has been you know, kept as close as they can to their hearts for hundreds of years. Unfortunately, it, it has kind of died off because it's not as common in the East and that's why it came to the West to keep it alive. So there's only a handful of us that have actually been trained authentically in this work. That's another thing to keep in mind. There's a lot of yeah, a lot of mist and fog out there. So just do your research and, and honor what's true to you. Right. And just to paraphrase, any of this white tigress work or work with the egg is about recentering, regrounding us in our heart space. It's not about getting a tighter vagina or exercising or doing Kegels in a certain way. I just want to make sure I, I'm understanding you correctly. Yeah, as I said, it's still part having a firmer vagina for you to experience more pleasure and for you to give your beloved more pleasure is part of it. It's just not the end all and be all. It's just like the cherry. The other part of it is from a physicality perspective is that, you know, perhaps after you've had children or if you haven't exercised your PC muscle much, it can actually help you tighten and firm that space purely for just a comfort. Like when you sneeze, you don't accidentally wear your panties a little bit. There are those kind of things. Yes, it can assist in giving you more orgasm pleasure. But that's just like the bonus of the actual experience of deepening the connection with yourself and starting to know yourself more and starting to actually shift that energy into heart space instead of just leaving it in the sex center, leaving it to just pleasure. That's the main thing. As I mentioned with Tantra in general, the Western perspective is that it's about pleasure. So we're shifting from that being, yes, beautiful and amazing place to explore and start, but only the start. So as long as we're knowing we're shifting, we're going on a journey to go deeper into ourselves, literally penetrate, not just the yoni, but penetrate the heart and then mind consciousness, then you're on the right path. So last question for you. I've so enjoyed our conversation. I I don't want to let you go. But the last thing I wanted to ask you was, I know you've written about how we tend to do this externalized goddess worshiping, right? We already talked about Kali. I know I love to work with like goddess oracle cards. And it's like we're clinging onto that in order to try to get more in touch with our true feminine nature. And I know that you've been talking a lot about that journey in as opposed to externally maybe worshiping goddesses. Can you just talk a little to that and give us some tips before we close? Definitely, definitely. Well, I'll include the article and there's there's some recording there as well, which will make it a bit more solidified. Conceptually, it's just that we're clinging to these symbols of the feminine, you know, the goddess cards or the crystals or the beautiful flowing outfits and just, you know, being bare feet at a moon time. All this is beautiful, but it's just the beginning. So from there, after we've explored this space, and you can always go there. I still have all my crystals, beautiful cards, like they're there. I just have shifted my perspective knowing that's not the final destination. That's it's like one doorway into understanding the symbolism and the ritual of feminine, but it's not the end journey to returning to the way of the feminine heart. So where to from there? We want to start, as I kind of touched on before, knowing your cycles because we shift from the heart into the emotion. Sorry, we shift from the feminine primal into the emotion, from emotion to heart. So from primal animal to the symbols, holding on to that, looking at your emotions, finding out, you know, what are my cycles? What are my patterns? What are my reactions? Is it normally around my moon time when you've got your period that you can be stroppy, short-tempered, sad? If someone does something or says something, what's your response or what's your reaction? How can you shift this? What are patterns in your life that have played out over and over and over again in romantic relationships, in your friendships, in your family? Start to understand you. The more you start to understand you, you know then when you slip into the animal nature and you just react to things and have impulses that are just to your detriment or when you can actually come from a place that is a bit calmer 
And as I say, be the calm in the chaos. So understanding your patterns is kind of like the bridging point to get you to heart, which is where we really want you to be. So that little journey there of of deepening and and exploring your patterns and cycles is going to take a bit of time. You're going to have to sit with it and contemplate it. Maybe write about it. Maybe speak to someone who can help you unpackage it. Maybe share it with a girlfriend or with your partner, whatever resonates with you. But start to contemplate it at least, you know, so that therefore you're shifting from this sexuality, desire, animal nature, physical form to then going into feelings and cycles, the, the fluid connector between primal and heart, as I said. So this is the solar plexus that you would be exploring there. From there, once you have kind of the understanding and, and you've been witness and you've held space for yourself and you're kind of feeling into what you're feeling, feeling into what you want to feel, you're able then to start journeying towards the heart. I love it. I think that's such good advice because I think we can totally get distracted with the outfits and the scarves and the crystals and the cards. And and really, it's just about like all spiritual practice, getting to know ourselves and our habits and, you know, taking those steps to really build self-awareness so that we can move forward consciously. So I'm so appreciative of you taking the time to talk to us today. I know I've taken a lot of your time. I'd love for you to tell listeners now where they can connect with you. How can they stay in touch, find you, and potentially even do some deeper work with you if they're interested? Sure, Brett. The best way to connect with me is on my website, which is stellamuse.com. And that's Stella with an A. There's lots of articles up there. There's recordings, there's videos, there's free videos, definitely. There's a free ebook. So lots of your questions could very well be answered there. If for some reason you feel drawn to connect with me, to ask a question, to work with me further, you're welcome to contact me from my contact page. And that's via email. And it's elise at stellamuse.com. Perfect. Well, we'll put all that info in the description box below. Elise, thank you so much for your time. And listeners, let me know, what did you think of this week's episode? Has it changed the way you think about Tantra, Tantric sex, or feminine energy? I would love to hear your thoughts and feedback in the form of an iTunes review or in our private Facebook group, savannaeast.com forward slash group. I'm so looking forward to your feedback. I know that I found this conversation uplifting and thought-provoking. Let me know what you thought as well. As always, I hope you have an absolutely amazing day filled with yoga, meditation, and a chance to slow down and connect with that beautiful feminine side of you, regardless of whether you are a man or a woman. I'm sending you so much love and good energy. Thank you for listening all the way to the very end. From my heart to yours, namaste. You've been listening to the Savannah Podcast. To find out more about Savannah, go to savannahspirit.com or follow Savannah on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Savannah Spirit. For daily inspiration, check out our blog at savannaeast.com. Be sure to join us next week for a new episode. And thank you for listening to the Savannah Podcast.